Welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host of the Catholic Book Worm. Ooh, Catholic something. <laughs> and welcome, Rebecca Martin. It's nice to have you with us today. Um, author of Love in the Eternal City. So, um, very love the book and excited to discuss it this morning. Um, how about you start us off with a prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill our hearts and our minds to inspire this conversation, to glorify you always, um, as we try to do in everything that we do. And we put all of our needs and intentions um, into your loving care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. So, um, I was thinking as I read your book, it's a romance. Mm -hmm. And as a as a teenager, my mom was into gothics romances. So I oh, okay. Um, and then sort of moved on. So this was really the first um, romance novel that I've read in a long time. Um, and I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, and I loved it. So I want to start with that. It was um, it was delightful. First of all, I've been to Rome. It's love in the Eternal City. It takes place in Rome. Um, so there was oh, yeah. so much of Rome in it that was really fun. Now, I, apparently you've been there. Yes, I joke that this is my love letter to Rome um, because I spent a semester there as a college student um, with Christendom College. And I actually lived right near where I set Elena's apartment. Um, and my commute to classes was through St. Peter's Square. So it was absolutely a, you know, a formative few months of my life. And we always joke at, at Christendom because a lot of us do the Rome program. Um, you come back and you're just always Rome sick. It's just kind of our, our phrase for like, you always just want to go back to Rome. Yeah, it's beautiful. I was there in 2005 with my husband and then I was back in 2019 with my daughter, which was Wonderful. a really awesome trip and three grandchildren being pushed in a carriage on cobblestones. You know? Oh my goodness. <laughs> we were brave. We were, we were. <laughs> We recovered on the beaches of Numana on the Italian Riviera after three days. It was like 104 in Rome when we oh. were there. Oh, there did was, you go in August? We were there the end of August, the last oh. last week of August. Um, so we drank a lot of Campari spritzes. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we later figured out that we had walked something like between seven and ten miles a day. Um, pushing yeah. the Bridge over cobblestones, um, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and the baby, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I do. I do miss the days of walking everywhere. I'm in suburbia, so there's a limit to how much I can walk. I'm like, oh yeah, when I was in Rome, I just, I just walked everywhere, and I thought nothing of it. Just walk miles to go see the next church. <laughs> Great. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we continue with Rome. <laughs> For sure. Uh, so my, again, my name is Rebecca Martin. I'm a book editor for OSV. I work for our Sunday Visitor. have been there for about six years. So basically, I joke that my uh, life entirely revolves around Microsoft Word um, because I'm an editor. I'm a freelance editor. Um, I do the communications for the lay Dominicans of the central province, um, and I write. So the only thing I do outside of Microsoft Word is garden. Um, that's pretty much my life. Um, but I live in Southeast Michigan with my husband and our three cats. And yeah, and like I said, discovering discovering that the Lord is wanting me to write as well as edit. You're going to have to let the kitties in before we, we finish. <laughs> if, I, if I weren't careful, one of them would come up and knock this vase off the window. So he's not allowed. <laughs> Yeah, cats. Yeah, they cats rule. What is it? Dogs drool. Cats rule. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. No, these these three they they have their own territorial dynamic, and it's it's just we're just along for the ride. Got it. <laughs> I've had both, so I know. So, love in the eternal city. Do you have a copy of the book handy there that you can show? I do, so I can show off the gorgeous cover, um, which I did not design. Oh, um, I love it. Uh, it's it's so pretty and it's like the nice soft matte cover um yeah so love in the eternal city um do you want to give the synopsis or do i well i so you you it's a love story obviously mm -hmm. you've got elena and benedict and um they meet um benedict's a swiss guard 
So yes. I learned a lot about the Swiss Guards that I had no idea about. Um, so did I as I was writing. <laughs> yeah. So tell us, maybe you want to start with him. Just tell us a little bit about the Swiss Guard because I think I had no idea. I sort of see them there, but I don't. Re I never knew anything about them. I, I just thought they were kind of like dressed up guys that, you know, sort of <laughs> guarded the place and <laughs> find out they're like trained militia. Um, oh, yeah. No, it's it's really fascinating. Um, so that's, that's the impression a lot of people have is they're just, you know, this there for show. Um, but they actually function like uh, in the U.S., our, our Secret Service. Um, they are a, a diplomatic guard. So it was really fun to dive into what they do on a daily basis and kind of how they function. Because um, Benedict is a young man from Switzerland. Um, the Swiss guards have to be between 18 and 35. Um, they have to be men of good character and they have to be Catholic. Um, and so, and they all have to have some uh, Swiss military training. So they come to Rome and it's a, you know, completely new experience for many of them. Switzerland's very rural. So that's a, that's an adjustment. Um, but they have such a, um, a very unique role, you know, in, in protecting the Pope and in um, kind of, you know, it's, it's different than just protecting a civil leader, you know, they're, they're protecting the man who's the head of the church. Um, and so it's, it's really cool to dive into them. And I actually worked with um, a former Swiss guard, Andreas Fidmer, um, who gave me a lot of, um, a lot of inside information. So I know more about Swiss guards than you can find on the internet now. <laughs> well, that was, that was a fun part of the book for me was to, to, to learn about that, having, having been to Rome and seen them. Um, but really, I had no idea that I just sort of they thought they were kind of like security guards. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then your your other main character is Elena, um, and she's she's there in the Eternal City to kind of regroup. She's had a she's had a bad situation with an ex fiance, and she's trying to put her life back together. Um, one thing I loved about your book is that, um, I mean, you tackle a lot of issues in your book. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I think often when we think of a romance novel, you know, we sort of have a set stereotype in our mind. And, and certainly there were elements of that in this book, but you pull in so many other real issues um, into the book. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, that was something um, I really wanted to do because, again, like as much as I was playing with the romance genre, um, genre conventions are what we call them, um, I really wanted to go deeper because um, I'm I was married a few years ago, so my own my own romance is, is semi fresh in my head, um, and there's really it's not a full love story unless you're actually talking about who each of these people are. Um, and what they're dealing with, what they're bringing into the relationship. So that was something that was really important to me was to not leave it at the, at kind of a superficial level, but to really go deep um, and present a story of, you know, what does a romance look like between two faithfully Catholic individuals who are both dealing with their own struggles as we all are. One of the first things you discuss is body image, which... So many of us women, we deal with body <laughs> image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, perfect. We think we don't. And if we don't, then we deal with all kinds of issues, with, especially with weight. Um, that's probably like the number one body image for most women. Mm -hmm. um, so you tackle that quite a bit in the book. Because yeah. Elaine is dealing with that. She is. And the one of the things I, I sort of did as I was writing, somewhat consciously, somewhat unconsciously, and I think every author does this with their characters, um, is the characters in the story become kind of a way to take an element of one's own life and sort of play it out on the big screen and see what it looks like. Um, and so that was, you know, part of the, a lot of, a lot of the kind of things that I tackle in the book are initiated by something that I was dealing with my own life. And that's definitely the case with body image. Um, and Elena and I both dealt with kind of a, sudden weight gain and then and then kind of having to tackle like you know what does this mean for me what do I look like um who do I want to be in the midst of this um so it was important to me just again kind of the reality check um to have a character who really is dealing with the things that a lot of us do deal with I found it interesting that um 
she works on that not by ha going on a diet but by working on her life mm -hmm. you know and yeah that was interesting things to me that you that you pulled into the story and I think it's it's really the essential there because again as, as I was discovering myself um the body image issues are rooted in one's own sense of, you know, one's own dignity as a child of God. Um, and without that, there always will be some sort of, of struggle between the ideal and reality. Um, if we, if we kind of lose sight of our own, our own value as a human. Um, and so I thought, you know, again, it's, it's something I'm still trying to understand fully. Elena's, Elena's growth journey is all there on the page. Mine's not yet. <laughs> well, I mean, we live in a culture. I mean, it, for instance, if you look at models back in the 1950s, um, say in this country, they weighed mm. 50 pounds more than the models today do. Yeah. Um, I mean, so we have this culture that just demands this radical thinness of women. So, so mm -hmm. much so that you really can't enjoy life, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, we're this food oriented culture. Um, as it as Rome is, you know, it's just that the food is just better there. But we're, you know, <laughs> both cultures are food oriented, and we get together. It doesn't matter what you get together for, whether it's a wedding, a funeral, you know, or just to hang out with friends. And it's like, what are you going to eat? <laughs> <That's what laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> well, and that's and that's one of the things Elena deals with is going to Rome because a lot of Italians just because of. Um, better food quality, but also because a lot of the cities are more set up for walking. So you're just naturally more physically active than a lot of Americans are. Um, there's kind of an immediate contrast. Um, and it's it's hard to miss when you're over there as an American or in a group of Americans. Um, and then you look around you at the Italians and you're like, oh, they're all skinny and they're all gorgeous. And you just they're sort of start to nice. lose sight. Yeah. And they're always stylish. <laughs> You can always pick out the Americans were the ones that look like slobs. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Italian women, you know. Yes. And that's if something you're wearing that, a skirt, like... you're Italian or at least European, most likely. And if you're in shorts, you're an American. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. And if I you're, if you're wearing jeans, they better be skinny. Right, right. Yeah. yeah so it, it's tough. You know, it's a tough culture. So you you do deal with that. You also deal a lot with um, uh, with the concept of women in self defense. So so Elena has an ex fiance who's who's a bit off the rails. I don't want to you know. Spoil it. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with we'll go with off the rails. <laughs> not a well person, and um, and so you know, being able to defend herself should things go awry is important. Um, but you really bring up the concept that just it's important in general for a woman. You know, we walk, sometimes we wind up, suddenly we're walking the streets alone somewhere or we're stuck somewhere to have some kind of knowledge of self-defense. Yeah. And it's interesting. Um, Benny originally actually, B Benedict, um, originally um, wants Elena to learn self-defense also just as a confidence booster. Um, and that's really kind of one of the things I wanted to bring out is that it's a really good, um, what I have seen and, and the little that I have done, which is very little, um, is it's it's allowing one to kind of be self-possessed and be aware of one's body in a very positive way. So it does play into like the body image sort of thing um, and, to, and to build one's strength and confidence so that if you are in a difficult situation, you can get yourself out of it. And unfortunately, I think, yeah, the reality is these days that we as women and especially, um, you know, especially if we're alone or if we're single, it's becoming more and more important for us to be able to at least have the situ situational awareness of, of the threats because it's, it's becoming less and less safe for us, unfortunately. Well, also with a culture that's been, you know, becoming unhinged. Oh yeah, um, less and less connected to family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see, you know, more mental health issues. We are seeing more mental health issues. I mean, it certainly came out after COVID when mm -hmm. people couldn't get to their groups and couldn't get to their, you know, self help groups and things like that. That you know, um, not to mention, you know, drug addiction and alcohol addiction and this kind of mm -hmm. prescription drugs and all of that. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things you bring out, so Elena had been dating um, Chris, is it? Yeah, Chris. Yes, Chris. Um, 
And there were lots of red flags in that relationship. So that's one of the things you talk about is becoming aware of red flags. So she's looking for red flags in this new relationship. <laughs> and, rightly, and rightly so, because she didn't look for them last time. And they were certainly there. Um, I, have a, I have a really good friend. And um, many years ago, she was marrying this gentleman. And her family saw all the red flags, but she didn't. Um, mm. To the point where they offered her like a trip around the world or they'd buy a house for her if she just didn't marry this guy. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> and she saw some of the red flags. But, you know, women, we always think we can heal him. We can fix him. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you bring that out. You know, she did marry him, um, and he did have extreme mental health issues. And, you know, she later got it, many years later, after she got a divorce and an annulment, thank goodness, based on mm. those mental health issues, um, but went through it, went through an awful lot. Um, yeah. Still grateful because she has two beautiful children. But, oh, good. But, but a very, very, very difficult mess um, to a gentleman who's, who's, artistic and a, in many ways a beautiful human being but too many mental health issues and so you bring up these red flags that when we're dating someone it's important to be aware of yeah and I think and one of the reasons that she that Elena doesn't necessarily put all the red flags together is because of kind of the subtlety of those mental health issues um because they were so because um Chris, the the character, um, he kind of was going on and off of his medications, um, and it's it sort of underscores the reality that when we are dealing with mental health issues, we're often very good at masking them and very good at hiding the problems. And it takes an openness and a vulnerability to say, "I have these issues and I need help." Um, and without that, you know, the the problems sort of keep bubbling under the surface and get to a crisis point. Um, and I think it, it, it was interesting to kind of dive into for Elena then, um, thinking about what is she bringing into this next relationship, not just looking for red flags with Benedict, but also um, assessing herself um, and wondering if she's even ready for a relationship given what she's struggling with now. So it's, it's an interesting, interesting conundrum that I may have tortured my characters with slightly. <laughs> well, at one point towards the end of the book, you, there's the line, Benny and I are both wounded people. Mm. Um, and, and so we, we have this understanding uh, in Catholicism that we are all wounded. We yeah. carry original sin. We carry our, you know, inclinations to the wrong things. Um, so that discernment of, you know, the, a difference between a red flag and, you know, a yellow flag, you know, right. a red flag and, you know, a pink flag sort of thing. <laughs> um, you know, we all have wounds. We all have issues, um, especially in a culture, for instance, now people are marrying later. So you meet people later. You have more baggage later than you have when yeah. you're 20. You're now you're marrying at 40. Um, so trying to discern between is this a red flag or is this just normal woundedness? Mm -hmm. um, you really bring up the concept um, of discernment and prayer. Yeah, that was also important to me. Again, kind of a lot of this coming from my own experience and those of, of close friends of mine as they kind of navigate the, the relationship um, world, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. Because we sometimes, I, I discovered in myself um, and with other young women, is that we often believe the fallacy that as soon as we find the right person, all the problems will go away. Um, and the, that there's something about marriage that just magically fixes everything. Uh, and that is very much not the case. <laughs> not the I case went at all. I marriage thinking that. I wasn't a Catholic at the time, but I went into marriage thinking, yeah, it fixes everything. Right. You're, you're two perfect people and you're in love and what more could you want? And, you know, um, and our, you know, I think also that thing, our love will fix everything. Right. You know? And that sense of our love is different than any other love that any two people have ever had. <laughs> and it is like above and beyond what anyone else has ever experienced because that, that newness of love is so intense and so mm -hmm. amazing. And then you find out you're, you're we're two wounded people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Oh, goodness, what have we done? <laughs> it's true. Well, and then if you're not careful, at least, you know, sometimes what can happen is you're like, well, God, you wanted, you clearly, you know, this is the person you meant for me. So why haven't you fixed all the problems? Um, like, Lord, what are you doing here? Come on, this is supposed to be easy. Um, and I, I really wanted to like dive into what that looks like when we are, when we do actually try to look at some of the problems ahead of time when we do deal with the woundedness and the vulnerability and healing within the relationship um, prior to marriage so that, you know, you're entering into marriage with a, a much stronger platform uh, to build on. But it's it's definitely a challenge and it takes a lot of, I said, a lot of vulnerability and a lot of humility um, to be able to share those issues with the other person and to accept that they're not perfect and I'm not perfect either. <laughs> Now, both Elena and Benedict are dealing with um, people that they have unforgiveness and anger and sometimes downright hatred towards. Mm -hmm. um, they both have a specific person that they really struggle with. Um, you know, Benedict, his dad, uh, relationship issues there, and obviously Elena with this, this um, crazy, terribly mentally ill ex-fiance who mm -hmm. hasn't quite let go. Um, and, and you really talk about the importance that unforgiveness plays and forgiveness plays in our healing as, as persons. Yeah, it's, it's something that we sort of relegate forgiveness, um, to the spiritual realm or to something that I just have to do intellectually. Um, but the reality is that, you know, it's, it's, it is like a physical wound that's constantly kept open. Um, when we hold on to that bitterness and that anger. And so it's it's impossible to heal fully while that while we're still almost deliberately keeping that wound open um, by choosing not to forgive. And that was um, that was something I had again kind of come to discover for myself. Um, I had had a um, bad breakup with a best friend and and I was holding on to a lot of things and I realized, you know, it's not, forgiveness is never a one-time thing. It's never just something I can say, oh, I forgive this person and that's it, I move on. It takes the constant little choices when the thoughts come up, when the feelings come up or the events to forgive again and again. And when we can heal that wound, then we allow the rest of our healing to be able to happen. But otherwise, we're just constantly keeping that wound open. Forgiveness, I tell people, is definitely a process. Yeah, You know, I mean, little things, you know, I forgive you, you took my pencil out of my desk, you know, okay. <laughs> but the big, stuff, the big stuff in life, you know, um, the sexual infidelity, the things that come from addiction and drugs and pornography and those kinds of deeper things um, and people that have betrayed us um, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, those kinds of, that kind of forgiveness, I call it the big forgiveness, is a process and, and I, you know, in my ethics class, I say, you're either working towards it or you're not. Mm -hmm. um, unforgiveness and forgiveness, they're not, they're not, they're never like just a static thing. No. You're no. digging deeper into unforgiveness or you're opening up towards forgiveness, but it's a, we're, a, we're a dynamic person. So there's always movement. Um, and, and to some extent, the will can push us in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's being aware of it. Um, you talk about, you know, therapy and depression and, you know, you're working sometimes in therapy, you know, for depression in your life. Um, but until you tackle that unforgiveness, um, it's, it's, you're not going to move too far forward. Exactly. Yeah. It, it reminds me, what is that saying? Um, being unforgiving is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I ain't that the truth. Yeah. Oh, man. Looking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's... So it really does fester in us. And it does affect us spiritually, physically, psychologically, emotionally. Yeah. Um, my, my father had a business partner um, that re way back before I was born or right after I was born who, who really kind of screwed him over and mm. stole the business. Um, and, and so I grew up with my father's anger and unforgiveness towards this man who was never repentant um, mm -hmm. and and I just saw what it did to him you know how it just kind of ate away at him and and there was no you know he was like this dog with this rotten bone he just couldn't 
couldn't let it go and it was really really sad um to yeah watch yeah well there's the reality too that forgiveness especially for the very big things like that it's it does require the grace of god you know it, it requires us to open ourselves up to the lord's plan being bigger and better than ours is and that's hard to do that's really hard to do I mean, I, I think of often that scene. Are you familiar with The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom? I have read it, but I'll see if I remember what you're talking about. <laughs> There's an amazing scene um, towards the end, a true story, you know, the, where she is, you know, the war is over and she's giving a talk at a church about, you know, her mm. experiences in the concentration camp and her sister, Corey, who had died, or Bessie, who had died. And... Um, as she comes out, there is the one of the guards that had tortured her sister. Mm. And he reaches out his hand to shake her hand. And he's saying, you know, thank you, thank you. Your your talk was beautiful. You know, your the forgiveness that's is important, you know, is is makes it, it has changed my life. Mm. And um, she sees this man and all she feels is you know, she's just given this talk on love and healing. Yeah. And she sees this man, and all she feels is hatred. Oh. All she feels is hatred. This is the man who tortured her sister. And she thinks to herself, I cannot shake this man's hand. I cannot shake this man's hand. And then she says she just feels Jesus pick up her arm and reach out and mm. shakes his hand. Wow. In, in, in love and forgiveness. And she feels the healing come for herself. Um, yeah, for her sister, and it's this beautiful moment. It's just pure grace. She's yeah. she writes about it, and you know she shares it with us years later when she's writing um, that she knows it's pure grace. She, yeah. That forgiveness came only by the grace of God. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is no small matter, you know. Right. <laughs> um, and and you know you think if she hadn't done that, how that would have just festered in her. You know, mm -hmm. he and then had a ripple on, effect. He would have just gone on his way, but it would have just stayed as this ugly kernel in her soul. And so, but she was mm -hmm. open to the grace. Yeah. You know, even though she, I mean, she knew she, it, it, you know, we can't do it on our own. Yeah. And it's, it's cool to see too, sometimes how that grace comes sometimes through other people, um, you know, through, through someone else, you know, saying something that we need to hear or, um, kind of giving us an opportunity to enter into that forgiveness. And that's interesting that, that especially like in that scene, like with the guard, uh, meeting the guard, you know, if, if that hadn't happened, you know, she wouldn't have, would, wouldn't have had that opportunity to respond to grace and to um, deepen that forgiveness even more. That's really beautiful. I need to go back and read it. I want to say I read it when I was 12 or 14 and definitely did not absorb as much as I wish I had. <laughs> It's a pretty amazing scene, and, and there's a couple of scenes from that that have always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's that final, that's one of the final scenes in the book. It's quite stunning. Yeah. One of the things you talk about also is that there's, um, in depression, in depression, and in especially after trauma, that there is a place for therapy, and there is a place sometimes for medication mm -hmm. to get you through stuff. Yeah, that's it's something that um, it, I'm, I'm formed very much by my Dominican spirituality. I, as I mentioned, I'm a lay Dominican. Um, and one of the kind of core aspects of that is the reality that we are um, integrated human beings. You know, we are body and soul together. Um, and healing has to happen in both. Um, and often, you know, there's there's always a spiritual component, but there's also of, always often at least a physical component. Um, and being able to recognize and treat and seek healing um, for mind, body, and soul all at once um, is really the ideal. And I think for us as Catholics, we have a, a certain, there's a certain responsibility to identify that, to, to recognize and, and say, you know, we can't pray it all away. At the same time, we can't medicate without dealing with the thoughts or dealing with the soul problems and and it's really um, particularly important, I think, as as you mentioned, you know, as we start dealing with more and more mental health issues in the world, um, to really have that integrated approach 
Um, and that's something that um, I had initially just mentioned it offhandedly with Elena that, oh, she should probably reach out to her therapist or something. And my editor really, really kind of pushed me on that and said, you know, this showing a scene or two with her therapist, with dealing with this would really strengthen um, that aspect of the character and the story. So that was actually something I went went back and, and uh, kind of added in the second round of edits. Yeah, I think it was good. I think also, I mean, it's, I think, it's also difficult nowadays, I want to just sort of put this out there mm -hmm. in this context, that it's hard sometimes to find a good therapist. There was mm -hmm. just an article in the um, the Catholic paper of Rhode Island, Rhode Island Catholic. Um, you know, we're looking for Catholic therapists. We're looking for, you know, if people are trying to find good people to go to therapy for. Um, and, and, you know, so I just want to say if something's not working, if your therapist isn't working, find another one. Search out yeah. another one. Um, and uh, Catholic, I think it's catholictherapist.com is where I've gone to. It's a directory of, of Catholic therapists. So you can search by your location. That's, that's where I've, where I've found and helped other people find good ones, but it's, it's definitely, it's a process and it can sometimes be really hard to find one and find a good one and find one that you can afford. <laughs> right. And find one you can afford. And also just because someone's Catholic doesn't mean they're a good therapist necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you may find someone who's not. I went, my husband and I years ago went to a Catholic therapist and, and she was a monster. You know, mm. she, she decided everything wrong in our marriage was his fault and everything right in our marriage was my fault. My, my and, and she was horrible. She was horrible to him. And um, so after about six sessions, I finally realized like, this really isn't fair. You know? oh. <laughs> I've got like such an advantage, which is, you know, two women, women tend to communicate better than men do easier. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it was like the two of us ganged up against him. And it was, oh. I suddenly realized, like, well, this, this is not right. <laughs> not healthy. <laughs> I could have gotten away with murder in that situation. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Catholic therapist. And she was really, you know, off the rails and, you know, I think mm -hmm. she, herself so you do have to be really careful when you go to a therapist you know um well and there are many good therapists who aren't catholic but will right. will understand and appreciate and bring in your own faith to right. their work yeah so so find someone that you know and be open to the fact that you know like this person is taking my side way too much yeah. they're not really helping me to um, yeah which i always find very interesting but it yeah. is difficult to find and and sometimes your best therapist can be a really good friend who's honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a really, really good friend, um, you know, I always say, look for friends that don't always take your side. Yes. That can be <laughs> honest with you and um, yeah. kind of challenge you to look at your own, your flaws and, and sort of work through them. If you have a friend that always agrees with you, be, you know, <laughs> like that's a real right aware. Point. It's terrible. Well, and that reminds me of the other the other friendship in, in Love in the Eternal City, which is Oscar and Benedict. Um and, and Oscar's definitely that friend who will totally tell Benny when he's when he's off the rails and, and needs to straighten out the way he's thinking. Right now in my life, um I'm working on some stuff and I'm working on it by going to weekly confession. Mm. Which I also has, I've never done weekly confession. I've always done like, you know, every couple of months kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's been, inter that's been an interesting process for me is to look at my flaws by going to weekly confession and get grace and, you know, an extra yeah. dose of grace um, along with it. And so while it's not therapy, it's a, a place where I can be like completely honest with myself. Mm -hmm. um, and my pastor and and sort of work through things that are important to me at this point in my life um, yeah. so I recommend that also as a as a, a really um good place sometimes to begin is is this you know sacrament of reconciliation absolutely um, you can get re you get reconciled with God but you can also work on getting reconciled with yourself um, yes yeah and that get, gets back to you know the spiritual healing is also going to help the the mental right. and the physical healing as well for sure yeah, yeah. so we talk, really talk about our lord as the physician of our souls so um you talk you mentioned also i just want to bring up well a couple things here confession <laughs> versus scrupulosity yes <clears throat> yes that was you know sorry go ahead no you go ahead because <laughs> 
Well, let's talk. What it, explain what scrupulosity is for those people. Who yeah. Don't know. So scrupulosity um, is actually pathologically part of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, that manifests specifically in the spiritual realm, and it's um, it's kind of this over um, over focus, over awareness of seeing sin where it might not be there, um, of of constantly worrying about every little thing possibly being a sin. Um, and often it can manifest um, specifically in holding one back from receiving Holy Communion um, for fear of very, very small things like, you know, your your lip is dry and you chewed off a piece of skin. Um, and does that break the fast? It's that kind of level of, of worry and fear. Um, and it's it's something that I've encountered in several of my friends who suffer from it. And, and it's, it's a suffering. I mean, it is absolutely something that is it's really self-critical. I mean, you're just, yeah, everything. you breathe wrong, you know? Right. And it, and it drives a wedge between you and God, because when you're so focused on those possibilities of offending him, even though it's from love of that, of not wanting to offend God, um, you really close yourself off to his mercy and his love. And it just can become so constricting. Uh, and Elena's case is very circumstantial. It's it's very much a side effect of the depression and the PTSD. Um, but it's something that many people struggle with for their whole lives. Um, and it was, uh, I actually, as an OSV editor, edited a book by Kevin Vost on scrupulosity um, that tackles it from the physical and the spiritual perspectives. And learned a lot through that process of reading that book. Um, but it's something that that just many people struggle with. And it um, it always breaks my heart to see people struggling with it and just like wanting to wanting to help. Um, and so it was very, um, very much something that was natural for Elena to deal with in that situation and provided an opportunity to just sort of bring it up as something that, yeah, people deal with. I mean, it really is a, that, that constant thought, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not mm -hmm. worthy. And I'm not worthy to the point where I won't receive grace. I won't reach for grace because, oh, I'm not worthy. Well, of mm -hmm. course we're not worthy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, just, grab, just grab it, you know. Just right. <laughs> get worthy, you know. Yeah. But it's that, that barrier to that, you know. We also, a lot of times, I think, not so much scrupulosity toward ourselves, but, you know, it, it, we have that tendency for, to direct scrupulosity to everybody else it's well, true why is that person receiving the eucharist you know they're not worthy yeah <laughs> checklist for people around us as well um mm -hmm. which also blocks grace for ourselves um, yeah because we're so busy you know making sure everybody else is worthy <laughs> right <laughs> it makes us pretty unworthy you know, you know forgiveness yes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There, there's so it's it's really a wonderful story that you've written. It, Thank you. You, just, you really, um, you know, bit off a lot to you know bring together a really um, very realistic love story in many ways. Um, but it is set in the Eternal City. It is set in Rome. Um, you've brought in that flavor, having been in Rome only twice, but you've certainly brought in that flavor, that Italian flavor of being in Rome. Um, you know, yeah, right, Dan, I loved it when she went to go into the, to go to the Eucharist, to go to Mass in St. Peter's, and the guard stops her like, oh, if you're a tourist, you can't get into that chapel. Because right. that <laughs> happened to us. It's like, wait a minute, you can't come in here. No, no, we're here for Mass, you know. Yes. That was something that was, it was interesting as I was, um, you know, going through edits and whatnot. I had to explain to my editors some of that because uh, at least one of them had never been to Rome. And she's like, what is going on in this scene? And I'm like, no, this is the normal experience right, of a pilgrim in Rome. You have the tourist part of St. Peter's and then you have these side chapels where you can actually go to mass. Mm -hmm. so the tourists are allowed to wander around the main cathedral part. Right. Of um, but you can. But still the guards are keeping an eye out. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I it was it was startling to me the first time I went um, because the the Eucharist is reserved in a side chapel um, where, where is there is perpetual adoration, um, but it's just there in a side chapel. And I it was very interesting to me to come in and have to be, almost verify to the guard that yes, I'm here to pray. I, like I know it's Jesus in there. I'm not just I'm not just looking at him. I know he's there. 
And where is he? Because he's kind of hidden over here. In kinda, yeah, behind the curtains. And yeah. You didn't mention, I was surprised that you need your, in all the cathedrals, all the churches in Rome, you need to have your shoulders covered. Yes. When you go in. And um, I don't remember if it was when I was, it may have been the first time at St. Peter's or it may have some, been somewhere else. And it was a hot summer day and I was wearing a, sort of spaghetti strap, um, summer dress. And we went to go in and they were like, no, 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 you know, probably the Swiss guard. I don't know. I was like, you know, no, no, you cannot come in here. You're improperly dressed. You know, yes. I was on this American going, I, I've got a lovely summer dress on. Like, what's the problem? And they're like, you know, your sexy shoulders are showing. You know, <laughs> you know I just, I'd forgotten about that because Christendom has a dress code. Um, and part of that dress code is I think our, our straps had to be a certain width. Right. And so it just, it never, it was never an issue that I had to deal with. So I actually totally forgot about that until you mentioned it. Well, and the other thing is, is that there's stalls of merchandise outside of St. Peter's and they sell crucifixes and rosaries and Bibles, mm -hmm. but they do not sell shawls. I'm just like, oh, yeah, you got to go down half a block for the scarves. Yeah, I think I'm somewhere. <laughs> so at one place, and I can't remember whether it was St. Peter's or not, the only option I had was to find paper towels in the oh, ladies' room sake. and wrap myself. They would not let me in until I'd wrap myself in paper towels. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I had these paper towels covering me, and they let me in. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, and I went back to the ladies' room outside somewhere there and found paper towels because <laughs> we didn't have any other clothing with us. We didn't have something like this that you could take. Right. So, Drape um, around. so for those of you ha ladies headed to Rome, make sure your shoulders are covered for all of the churches and cathedrals. Yes. Um, At least the major of basilicas, but most yeah. of the churches. Um, yeah. Shoulders covered. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd forgot. I'd forgotten about that. Oh my word! I don't funny. think they're they're not quite as stringent now as they used to be, but it's still a thing. Yeah. Well, that was 2019. Okay, never mind then. I retract. Yeah, my that statement. was 2019 when I was there with my daughter. That okay. was during that hot time, and I think at one point, actually, this is really funny. At one of the cathedrals with my daughter. We, we put diapers, we put pampers oh my on my shoulders for this one. And my daughter was, she was like, I'm not doing it. And I said, she didn't have a shawl, but I did because I'd remembered my St. Peter's and paper towels. And so she took my scarf and put that over her shoulders. And I took two paper diapers from the stroller and put them on my shoulders. And they let us in like that because my shoulders were covered. And oh yeah, my gosh! That, that was 2019, and I think oh, that was geez. at Castello de Angela. Ah, Castello de Angelo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it was going in there that I went in with diapers on my shoulders. <laughs> Paper diapers. Oh man! Right. You wonder what you wonder sometimes what the guards are thinking then when they see people covering their shoulders and. I wonder what the weirdest things they've seen people use. I, oh I yeah, you know underwear. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's I, too I funny. Forgot about the diapers. On oh my, my gosh! Yeah, well, there you go. That's a memory you'll have forever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Mom, you're ridiculous." I'm like, "Yeah, but we want to go in." I said, "You've got to see this church. It's one of the mm -hmm. most. Beautiful. It's my favorite one in Rome, um, besides yeah. St. Peter's." And um, so, oh, anyway. funny. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's so much you've, you've really it's really a delightful book I, I oh, love thank you. reading it uh, like I said I, I don't get a chance to read romances very often I'm usually reading philosophy and theology heavy duty philosophy theology um, and I don't get to just a chance to read something delightful um, but yet you yeah. know like I said you captured a lot of important issues for men and women you know dating and looking into marriage and and the whole discernment and healing mm-hmm Process. And again, that that one of those final lines, Benny and I are both wounded people. Um, we're all wounded people, you know, yeah. we're, you know, and marriage is so difficult. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a difficult state to enter into um, that being aware of the, many of the things that you've brought out in the book are really important. Yeah. 
It was a lot of fun to write and, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's, it's interesting. I've been hearing from a number of people who mostly like friends and family who are reading it because they like me, but um, who are like, you know, I don't normally read romance, but I really enjoyed this. And that's, that's really exciting to hear because it's, you know, as much as it's playing to the genre conventions, I wanted it to be a good story. Um, and, and not to, again, not to stay on the superficial level. It's, it's been really fun hearing back from people who have just enjoyed going, enjoyed experiencing Benny and Elena's story. Yep. Delightful. Is there anything else you'd like to mention that we didn't touch on? I'll just give a shout out to my publisher, Chrism Press, um, which does good Catholic fiction. And we just, we enjoy a well-told story from the Catholic imagination and, I, if you like Eternal Love in the Eternal City, um, you should definitely check out the rest of what they have to offer. Um, and also stay tuned because this is the first of a trilogy. So That was my next question, was yes. what's in the works? <laughs> so so Rihanna and Oscar's story will be the next one. What is the name of it? Uh, that will be uh, Love in the Glass City. Uh, part of it will take place in Venice, um, but it will be uh, Rihanna and Elena's story, or Rihanna and Oscar's story, sorry, the, the, oh, the two friends okay. from this, this oh, book, nice. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, Good to dive into theirs. Touch with me because I'd love to read it. And For sure. Interview, that'll be fun. So you're working on, and there's a third one? That's Yes. So the third one will be um, Oscar's little brother as a recruit in the Swiss Guards. So we'll get to see kind of um, a young young Swiss Guard starting out. Um, and then Elena's younger sister, who is a archaeology student uh, working in Pompeii. So that was gonna, that one will be Love in the Buried City. And that will be... Coming out sometime in the distant future because I have to finish the next one first. <laughs> Pompeii, that's the one place I did not like. Mm. Oh, I, I, I'm a history nerd, so I, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> but it's, it's a challenging place to visit, for sure. I felt like a voyeur. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. There's always a little bit of that, yeah. It's very interesting to me how, how disturbing I found it to be there. Mm. Amazing, but... I was like, all right, get me out of here. <laughs> That's probably a good sign for your sensitivity. Take me back to Amalfi. We were staying in Amalfi. Oh, there you go. It was like, get me out of here. Oh, let so, me go see the turquoise ocean. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, would you like to end us with a prayer? For sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this time together, um, for all the ways you're working through each of us in our work, um, and all the ways you're working through the souls of our listeners. And we just ask that uh, all that we do, all that we say and are, um, gives glory to you. As we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay in touch. And uh, if I get back to Rome, which I hope I do eventually, your your story will definitely be on my mind. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much.